Hello guys, my name is Shubham Arora. Today I am here to present you some slides on cloud computing along with a high level walkthrough on AWS. So this is the agenda which we will be covering. On the left side you can see that I will be covering what is cloud computing, what are the uses of cloud computing, how we can benefit an organization from cloud computing and what are different type of cloud services which are being provided like IaaS, PaaS and SaaS. We will discuss about type of cloud deployments which are private, public and hybrid. Then at last we will discuss about how cloud computing works. So this agenda is not limited to just cloud computing. I'll, I'll just add on another few slides to this which will be related to AWS and on the right side the agenda to AWS is there. So what is AWS? How AWS portfolio looks like? A brief timeline of AWS, how AWS have evolved over the years, what is the AWS reputation in the market, how AWS global infrastructure looks like, where they have their footprints, what is a region, what is an availability zone which we call AZ. And we will look at different customer success stories from all industries as well. And at last, I would take you through all the widely used services which you have divided into par two parts part one and part two so it will be easy for you to understand I'll just take you through all those services coming to the slide what is cloud computing so simply put cloud computing is the delivery of computing services like servers storage databases networking software analytics and more over the internet which we call cloud Companies offering these computing services are called cloud service providers and typically charge for cloud computing services based on usage similar to how you are built for water or electricity at home. So when you consume water or electricity at home, on every month you receive the bill from those departments. In the same way, when you start consuming the cloud computing resources like servers, network, databases, on, by end of every month you receive the billing from them. This slide basically talks about the usage of cloud computing. You are probably using cloud computing right now. Even if you don't realize it, if you use an online service to send email, add a document, watch movies or TV, maybe to listen to music and play games or store online pictures and other files, it is likely that cloud computing is making it all possible behind the scenes. The first cloud computing services are barely a decade old but already a variety of organizations from tiny startups to global corporations, government agencies to non-profits are embracing the technology for all sorts of reasons. Here are the few things which you can do with the cloud. You can create new application and services in the cloud. You can store your data in the cloud, you can back up your data in the cloud and when you want to recover it at some point of time, you can recover that data. You can host your websites and blogs in the cloud. You can stream audio and video in the cloud. If I talk about streaming the audio and video, I would like to take an example here of uh, Netflix and uh, Amazon Prime services. They are now offering the videos which, which can stream on any of the device with even, even when you have the low internet connectivity, they will run without buffering. So how this is happening now? This is happening with the help of uh, cloud computing services, which are using some kind of mechanism, which is just uh, streaming the audio and video files to your device smoothly. We can uh, deliver the software on demand using the cloud, and we can analyze the data for patterns and make prediction based on that. So this all can be done with the help of cloud computing. This slide will talk about top benefits of cloud computing. So cloud computing is a big shift from the traditional way businesses think about IT resources. What is it about cloud computing? Why is cloud computing so popular these days? Here are six common reasons organizations are turning to cloud computing services. One is cost. So when I talk about cost, it means cloud computing eliminates the capital expenses of buying hardware and software and setting up and running on-site data centers. It means the rack of servers, the round-the-clock electricity for power and cooling, the IT uh, experts for managing the infra infrastructure. So it's adding up fast. 
Second point is speed. So most cloud computing services are provided self-service and on-demand. So even vast amount of computing resources can be provisioned in minutes, typically with just a few mouse clicks, giving businesses a lot of flexibility and taking the pressure off capacity planning. Coming to global scale, the benefit of cloud computing services include the ability to scale elastically in cloud speak that means delivering the right amount of IT resources for example more or less computing power maybe storage bandwidth right when it's needed and from the right geographical location so it's it's providing you very much flexibility if you want to provision any resources at any point of time from anywhere you can do that productivity on-site data centers typically require a lot of racking and stacking hardware setup, software patching, and other time-consuming IT management cores. So cloud computing removes, removes the need for many of these tasks, so IT teams can spend time on achieving more important business goals, which are basically representing their business. Performance is another uh, benefit of cloud computing. The biggest cloud computing services run on a worldwide network of secure data centers, which are regularly updated upgraded to the latest generation of fast and efficient computing hardware. This offers several benefits over a single corporate data center, including reduced network latency for applications and great economies of scale. Reliability is the last but not least point. Cloud computing makes data backup, disaster recovery and business continuity easier and less expensive because data can be mirrored at multiple redundant sites on the cloud parameters provider's network. So if you are storing your data somewhere in a public cloud service provider data center, it, it is uh, allowing you to create certain uh, replicas of, of that resource in the cloud. Now we will look at the type of uh, cloud services. Majorly, it, it has been divided into three major categories infrastructure as a service which we call IaaS, PaaS and SaaS. So most cloud computing services fall into three broad categories infrastructure as a service, platform as a service and software as a service. These are sometimes called the cloud computing stack because they build on top of one another. Knowing what they are and how they are different makes it easier to accomplish your business goals. So these are three, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. This basically uh, has been divided based on the responsibility of the cloud service provider and the customer. Like if uh, I would like to show you a slide which will depict it and de depict a clear picture of this. So on the very left, you can see infrastructure as a service. We have multiple layers and uh, you can see few part has been managed by the vendor and a couple of things are being managed by the customer. So you can see networking, storage, servers and virtualization. This all being managed by the vendor or the public cloud service provider. Uh, and on the top you can see operating system, middleware, runtime, data and application. Everything is being managed by customers. So infrastructure as a service is uh, more about providing you the infrastructure the applica uh, infrastructure, the servers to run your application. So they will just provide you the flavor of operating system. Like you want to run your application on Windows or Linux based operating system, you will be provided that. On top of that, you will be responsible for making the patching, uh, all the all the application configuration. So you will be taking care of that part. Platform as a service, which is the second point. So here the responsibility of vendor increases and customer uh, has less responsibilities here. So you can see networking, storage, servers, virtualizations, operating system, middleware and runtime. This all is being managed by a vendor. You are just managing the application and the data lying on that server. The last major service uh, type of uh, cloud services software as a service. Here you will see that all the components whether it's networking, storage, server, virtualization, operating system, till application and data. Everything is being managed by vendor. I'll tell you the example of the software as a service like Office 365. So most of the organizations are using this uh, service Office 365 
and uh, they are just getting a URL to just log into their inbox and they can just fire the mails from from that inbox so they are not managing anything on premise everything is being managed by Microsoft in the backend and they are just able to see the beautiful console to send and receive the emails so this is the example of software as a service this slide will talk about types of cloud deployments we have three type of cloud deployment models one is private cloud public cloud and then hybrid cloud public cloud. public cloud are owned and separate uh, owned and operated by third-party cloud service provider which deliver their computing resources like servers and storage over the internet Amazon web services is an example of public cloud with the public cloud, all hardware, software, and other supporting infrastructure is owned and managed by the cloud provider. You access these services and manage your account using a web browser. So when you want to create an account on AWS, it just asks you to uh, provide you a few details. You just simply sign up, likewise you do on a social website, and you are good to go. You can, you can use their services for the entire year for free in the basic tier model coming to the private cloud private cloud refers to cloud computing resources used exclusively by a single business or organization a private cloud can be physically located on the company's on-site data center some companies also pay third-party service providers to host their private cloud a private cloud is one in which the services and infrastructure are maintained on a private network last one is the hybrid cloud. Hybrid clouds combine public and private clouds bound together by technology that allows data and applications to be shared between them. By allowing data and applications to move between private and public clouds, hybrid cloud gives businesses greater flexibility and more deployment options. The most important thing here is how cloud computing works. So, so far we were discussing like what are different type of uh, cloud models and uh, what is cloud computing. But the question which will be coming to everybody's mind is how cloud computing works. So let's have a look on that as well. Cloud computing services uh, all work a little differently depending on the provider. But many provide a friendly browser-based dashboards that make it easier for IT professionals and developers for or, uh, to order resources and manage their accounts. Some cloud computing services are also designed to work with REST APIs and a command line interface, which is called CLI, giving developers multiple options to use. So, so far we have discussed more, more or less about the cloud computing in general. We have discussed about the public cloud, private cloud. So now we will be focused towards what is AWS, which is the market leader in public cloud service platform these days. So let's have a look on that. Cloud computing with Amazon Web Services. Amazon Web Services is a secure cloud service platform offering compute power, database storage, content delivery, and other functionalities to help businesses scale and grow. Explore how millions of customers are currently leveraging AWS cloud products and solutions to build sophisticated applications with increased flexibility, scalability, and reliability. So when I, when I talk about AWS, one may ask me like why do i learn aws what is it what is the benefit of uh, learning aws where will i see myself uh, after learning aws will it make any difference to my current knowledge or current profile so yes there are a few points which i would like to answer on this first uh, aws is the fastest growing cloud computing platform on the planet this is the largest public cloud computing platform on the planet more and more organizations are outsourcing their IT to AWS and now AWS has launched their certification which are the most popular IT certifications right now and I must say this, that if, if somebody is uh, working on AWS so this is the safest place to be in IT right now you can also refer the link below to understand why I'm saying that AWS is a safe place in IT I just found this link from some tech blog you can also refer this link in order to understand what I'm saying. This is the picture of uh, AWS portfolio. 
they have now more than 80 services on the platform which are being widely used by millions of customers so yes we will have a look on this aws portfolio in this session only i would like to take you through a brief timeline of aws how aws started and now uh, how come they they just thought to uh, make it as a uh, make it as a public cloud offering for the customers so in 2003 Chris Pinkman and Benjamin Black presented a paper on what Amazon's own internal infrastructure should look like. So they suggested selling it as a service and prepared a business case. They launched their first official service which was SQS in 2004. In 2006 Amazon launched itself. In 2007 in a just one year when the AWS officially was launched they had one like 80,000 developers on the platform. In 2010, all of Amazon.com just completely moved over to AWS. In 2012, they had their first reInvent conference. Reinvent conference uh, every year happens in Las Vegas and AWS invites their customer to attend that where they just uh, they just uh, discloses and they just uh, updates their customer about their new launches, about their new services. Uh, and this happens every year so in 2012 they they had their first reinvent conference in Las Vegas in 2013 they launched the certification likewise other uh, other vendors too likewise Microsoft and uh, Cisco and many other publishers have their own certification in order to certify the knowledge on their platform by an individual so AWS too had their certification in 2013 and in 2014, they were committed to achieve 100% renewable energy usage for its global footprint. In 2015, AWS breaks out its revenue and they had $6 billion USD per annum and growing close to 90% year on year. So this is the beautiful journey of AWS so far. Now coming to the point, what is the AWS reputation in the market? I will refer to the Gartner studies because this is the most trusted uh, trusted uh, study which one can rely on. So as per Gartner's magic quadrant, AWS is always leading the market. In May 2015, AWS was named as market leader in the IAS magic quadrant for the fifth consecutive year. And this has not come down in year 2017 as well. They are still the market leader. Microsoft is following AWS and then we have many many other public cloud service providers which are in visionaire quadrants like CenturyLink, Google Cloud, VMware, IBM has got its cloud like IBM software and there are many others which are niche players. So AWS is leading the market no doubt. I would urge everyone to just just make their account on AWS and start exploring the services. You will of course you will for sure get benefit of it. This is the picture of AWS global infrastructure. AWS cloud operates 44 availability zones within 16 geographical regions around the world with announced plans for 17 more availability zones and 6 more regions in Bahrain, China, France, Hong Kong, Sweden and a second AWS government cloud region in the US. So they have very good footprints around the globe. So one if, uh, if one if is planning to launch uh, their resources in the public service cloud service provider, so I would suggest to go with AWS. This slide basically talks about what, what is a region and what is an availability zone. So a region is a geographical area each region consists of two or more availability zones and availability zone is simply a data center so i would like to make it easy by an example let's say i talk i say that india has uh, got aws data center so india is like a region and in india aws have chose to create multiple data center as of now they have one data center in in Mumbai they have planned to launch another data center maybe in Bangalore so these data centers will be called availability zones so in a region we can have multiple availability zones 
and which the, these availability zones or data centers are connected by the fiber cables so when we launch an uh, availability uh, launch a resource in one availability zone and the copy of that uh, availability uh, that resource in is in the second availability zone so in that case both uh, replicas are synchronously replicating with each other on very high bandwidth this slide have uh, information about customer success stories from all industries there are uh, many many big customer giant companies which are using aws uh, services has kellogg's suncorp vodafone Expedia, Dow Jones, NTT Docomo, Novartis, Candy Nest, Siemens, Adobe and Comcast. There are thousands of companies which are really loving using AWS services. So I would suggest you guys to go to customer stories for AWS. Just Google it and you will see thousands of customer success stories available. Coming to the part, the widely used services. So this slide basically have all the services in a consolidated form, which are being used widely by, by the customers on AWS. First component is cloud component, uh, is compute component. So in the compute component, we have uh, got multiple services covered. Elastic cloud compute. So elastic cloud compute, Amazon EC2, which we call it. Amazon EC2 provides scalable computing capacity in the AWS cloud. Using Amazon EC2 eliminates the need to invest in the hardware upfront so that you can develop and deploy applications faster. You can use Amazon EC2 to launch as many or as few virtual servers you need to configure uh, in the cloud. Coming to the ELB. ELB basically distributes incoming application traffic across multiple EC2 instances in multiple data centers. So let's say you have created an ELB and a web request coming to that ELB. We have got multiple uh, EC2 instances which are playing the role of web servers behind that load balancer. So ELB will receive the request and will start distributing the request in a, in a fashion which has been defined in the algorithm most of most of the time it is round robin to the backend servers so they will start responding accordingly so basically elb increases the fault tolerance of our application here the load balancer serves as a single point of contact for clients which increases the availability of your application you can add or remove ec2 instances from your load balancer as the need changes we can also configure the health check which are used to monitor the health of registered instance so that the load balancer can send requests to the healthy instances. Most of the time what happens is let's say we have got uh, uh, four servers behind a load balancer which are working, uh, which are serving the web request to the customer. So let's say one server have got something bad with it and it's not responding. So ELB will detect that health check is not properly uh, properly rece getting received from that instance. So that instance will go out of service. ELB will stop sending new requests to that particular instance, and we'll just take that instance out. We will fix what, what whatever is bad there, and then we will just add that instance again back to the uh, ELB. So this is how ELB works. The next point is auto scaling. Auto scaling helps you ensure that you are uh, you have correct number of Amazon EC2 instances available to handle the load for your application. You create collection of EC2 instances called auto scaling groups. You can specify the minimum number of instances in each auto scaling group, and auto scaling ensures that group never goes below this size. You can also specify maximum number of instances in each auto scaling group, and auto scaling ensures that group never goes above this size for example i, I i'm going i'm planning to launch an uh, web application and uh, for now i just do it, want to do it for for some pilot users i do not want to roll out it for all the customers so i'm good to go with two servers only at this point of time so what i'll do i'll simply put those servers uh, i'll simply just define the size of auto scaling that the minimum size to launch my application is two and the maximum size is three so auto scaling will ensure that my application will never go below the minimum size. 
if I terminate one instance out of the two running, it will automatically detect that one instance has gone down and the minimum size is two. So it will just again launch the another instance to meet the criteria of two. Again, autoscaling is a very cool feature and most of the e-commerce site use this feature because they don't know when the what kind of load they, they might be expecting. Maybe millions of users will be hitting the website and if they do not use auto scaling feature then their site may crash they may receive uh, lots of load and their site might not be able to handle all that load so it's better to use uh, auto scaling in order to deal with the high traffic demands in the compute the most important topic is lambda which is which is very hot hot pick these days and lambda is basically a serverless compute service that runs your code in response to events and automatically manages the underlying compute resources for you. Then let's have a look at the storage options. We have got simple storage service, which we call S3. S3 is uh, again a widely used service in Amazon. AWS S3 is a storage for the internet. It is designed to make web scale computing easier for developers. AWS S3 has a simple web services interface that you can use to store and retrieve any amount of data at any time from anywhere on the internet. It gives developer access to highly scalable, reliable, fast and inexpensive data storage infrastructure that Amazon users uses to run its own global network of websites. So this is a very important service for the developers and uh, it has got certain features that, that you can store the you can store any object of any type on the aws cloud which starts from one byte of size to 5 tb of size at a time you can upload 5 gb of file on s3 and if you have a file bigger than 5 gb so yes of course you can upload that file but using the multi-part upload feature of s3 so it has got many features like versioning, lifecycle management. If you if you you have a plan to keep your data on S3 for let's say two or three months, and after that you have planned to move that data to cheaper storage. So S3 has got that feature as well. You can choose to move that data to Glacier by applying the lifecycle policies, which is very easy to use with the help of a web interface. And uh, then coming to the storage gateway, storage gateway is basically basically enables the uh, enables your on-premise application to use the cloud-based storage so when you want to just uh, integrate that cloud-based storage with your on-premise application so storage gateway provides you an SCSI interface to connect your application with the cloud-based storage and it has got again couple of different uh, option like uh, gateway cast uh, gateway cache to storage gateway gateway uh, stored volumes so you, you have got many options to work on on st storage gateway. Last but not the least from the storage endpoint EFS which is Elastic File Storage. Elastic File Storage is basically uh, compatible more, uh, more compatible with Ubuntu and Linux operating systems and you can uh, uh, you can you can launch as many as many disk size you need. Likewise in Windows environment what we do in the EBS volume we just launch a volume of 500 giga of size does not matter whether we are using 50 GB of that and 450 GB of that volume is is just going in the wastage but we are we have still uh, we have still just uh, provisioned that that much amount of volume and we'll have to pay for that but EFS gives us the flexibility to use the amount of data volume which we have which we are actually using the minimum chunk size is of 8 GB so it will increase the size of data chunks in 8 GB coming to the security AM we call it identity and access management so this basically enables us to create the users enabling the multi-factor authentication MFA for them creating the access key ID secret access key x509 certificates all the user credentials will be created with the help of IEM we can create groups in that and we can add the users to the relevant group as per their responsibilities we can also create roles in that so those roles will be responsible to uh, call another service uh, on behalf of uh, one service so let's see if you want to 
call S3 services from the EC2 instance, we will create an IAM role which will be attached to that EC2 instance and this role basically will help to call the S3 services from EC2 instance. So with the help of IAM, we can do the password management as, as well. Password lifecycle policies will be managed from IAM. Coming to the directory service, directory service basically will help uh, us to implement our active directory solution in cloud. So most of the organization which have their own, uh, which have their active directory in on-premise infrastructure and they have certain application which are in, which are in cloud. Now they want some kind of integration between on-premise active directory and cloud directory service. So this directory service basically helps them to achieve, uh, achieve their, uh, such kind of integration. WAF and Shield talks about adding additional uh, security layer to the application. Cloud HSM. Cloud HSM is a cloud hardware security module, and with the help of this, you can you can manage your uh, all the credentials which are being used in cloud. This is very expensive service by Amazon, but this is worth using it, and most of the big enterprises use this service. Last, last but not the least from this slide is the management tools. So we have got four management tools here, CloudWatch, CloudFormation, CloudTrail and Trusted Advisor. So CloudWatch is the monitoring service of AWS. With the help of this, you can, you can monitor uh, almost all the metrics uh, which, which are there. You can, you can monitor the CPU utilization, RAM utilization, which is the part of custom metrics. You can use uh, use this CloudWatch to monitor any of the custom metric which you wish for. So CloudWatch is really great tool, very strong, which you can use to monitor uh, anything. Then CloudFormation. CloudFormation is uh, again hot pick uh, in AWS services and this will be basically used, uh, used if you, you are planning to write your infrastructure in the form of code. We call it as infrastructure as a code service also. So you just uh, have to create a template and in case of disaster recovery solution, if you have that template with you, you can just, you can just fire up all your resources with the help of that template within few minutes. Your infrastructure will be ready. Then coming to service CloudTrail. CloudTrail is the auditing service. When you just go to the AWS console, you click on any service. So it, it means you are just making an API call to the backend that api call is being recorded recorded with the help of cloud cloud trail service so cloud trail basically is an auditing service like who's making changes to what service if even if you are just launching an instance you are launching a security group along with that you are making uh, making changes in the rules of that security group everything is being tracked by the cloud trail service so this is how aws has uh, got a lot of services uh, which works in integration and very beautifully La, uh, then then coming to the tool trusted advisor trusted advisor is an application which basically scans your uh, environment based on four metrics cost optimization security performance and uh, fault tolerance so this is scans your environment on the basis of all these uh, metrics. If I talk about the cost optimization, it will look at your environment, will, will, will suggest you all the options to save the cost. If it identifies that few of the EBS volumes which are uh, lying underutilized, like there is no input output to those volumes, no read writes are happening to those volumes. So it will just uh, highlight you those volumes and will suggest you to just create a snapshot of that and just delete that volume. So in that case, you can just save huge cost with the help of cost optimization. If I talk about the security, then it will suggest you to close all the security gaps which are there. Let's say if you have, if you have not enabled multi-factor authentication uh, for, for any user, it, it will suggest you why you have not enabled it. Just enable the multi-factor authentication right away for that user. So such kind of uh, gaps it suggests to close. Widely used services part two will will have uh, four points again: networking, messaging, migration, and database. So networking is the major and most important part of AWS. The VPC it has got CloudFront, Direct Connect, and Route 53. VPC is like a virtual private cloud. 
or we can say it as a likewise we have in our traditional data centers we have got a data center inside that we have got routers switches servers racks everything is there so that is a complete data center outlook so in the same way in cloud we we have got vpc which is virtual private cl cloud inside which we can uh, launch we can launch route tables we can create subnet we can uh, attach the internet gateway to it, uh, it uh, to it to provide the internet connectivity we can do whatever we want we have the choice to create the network of our choice let's say i'm planning to create an ip series uh, ip subnet of uh, series 10000/24 so i have the flexibility to do that so vpc is basically uh, more about that thing then coming to cloud front cloud front uh, uh, provide you the flexibility and it enables you to enables you to uh, stream the media whether it's uh, web media or it's rtmp or some something like which uh, which you would like to stream on your device so you can you can use this cloud front which has edge locations in behind the scene and you will be able to stream those medias faster on your device with the help of cloud front securely direct connect Direct Connect is a, another service uh, by Amazon, which is the which is which is very secure. And if you uh, this is the alternate for uh, VPN solution. So VPN solution basically works on IPsec, which eventually uses your internet connection in order to make a secure tunnel between your VPC and your on-premise data center. But Direct Connect works in a different way. If your requirement is to have a uh, high bandwidth. So you will go for direct connect. This is little expensive solution, but if the plan is to have good amount of bandwidth, then of course this is a good to go solution. Route 53 is a DNS service provided by Amazon. This is very similar to what GoDaddy offers. GoDaddy offers uh, uh, domain hosting. So this Route 53 also offers domain hosting. This does not offer uh, website hosting and all that stuff, but yes, domain hosting is available there. You can register your domain to Route 53 and you can host your domain here. You can start creating the relevant records which, which might be required like A record, Quad A record, MX record, NS records. So all the records can be created here and uh, everything can be managed with the help of Route 53. So this way you can you can understand that Amazon does not have any dependency on GoDaddy and other DNS service providers. They have got their own on uh, Route 53 service to achieve this goal. Messaging service have got three three services in it: simple queue service, simple notification service, and simple email service. So simple queue service is basically uh, for the applications uh, which works on uh, decoupling architecture. So there is there are two nodes. One is the producer node. One is the consumer node. So producer nodes uh, node just consumes uh, just produces something which has to be consumed by consumer node. And SQS comes in between. So when let's say producer node is uh, producing something like 10, uh, 10 requests per second. And consumer node can receive only five requests per second. So just to stop the overflow, we just put the SQS in between, which just keeps those requests uh, on hold with it and make sure that every request will be delivered to the consumer node at least once. So this is how SQS works. Simple notification service. This is very important. This enables you to send the notification to any of the monitoring email ID if you want uh, if you want to get notified yourself or your NOC team monitoring team for any of the event which is happening with your resources in the cloud you can use simple notification service so, yes this is this is more or less about the messaging services then we have got migration services uh, we have many options there we have got database migration service server migration service and then snowball then the database database talks about rds databases we have got oracle mysql microsoft sql postgre all of these are part of rds then coming to dynamodb this is uh, uh, this is unstructured uh, uh, for unstructured data dynamodb is equivalent to mongodb if you have heard about that and then elastic cache elastic cache basically uh, helps you your application to interact with the database on 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 
very fast interval let's say if you want to interact with the database or your application want to interact with the database we will put that elastic cache in between and this elastic cache will basically have the frequently accessed query uh, queries from the database cached to it so that whenever the repeated query comes into the database it will just first will be checked at the elastic cache level and if this will have the response to that query that will be answered direct from the elastic cache Amazon Redshift. Amazon Redshift is a data warehousing solution which is again in heavy demand and which is highly being used by the Amazon uh, customers. So yes, this was uh, more or less uh, which I had to uh, discuss in this slide. If you have further questions, just post uh, post those questions uh, in the in, in my YouTube channel. You have uh, the option to post there. And thank you guys for uh, watching this video. Thanks a lot.